Okay. Back at it. Okay. Water hydrated. And then we go. Okay. Main mission time. <clears throat> Sanctions and demonstrations won't suffice, Sam. We need to act, and I'm talking about more than a sternly worded letter. I sympathize with your frustrations, gentlemen, but surely you can understand my reluctance to kick the hornet's nest. Paul Revere. Paul Revere? Paul Revere. You'll have heard of Paul Revere's midnight ride, of course. He was one of several riders sent to war in Lexington and Concord over coming military raid on April 18th. That's my birthday. 1775. Revere's role in the revolution was larger than that. However, he was a member of the Sons of Liberty and the Continental Congress, and a participant in the Boston Tea Party. By trade, Revere was a silversmith, and one of the most skilled craftsmen in the colonies. He also did copper plate engraving, most notably the image of the Boston Massacre that depicts British soldiers firing into the unarmed crowd at point-blank range. A very effective piece of propaganda. You get very little copper plate propaganda these days. It's a dying art. Revere was also a shrewd businessman and he went where the money was. When silver work wasn't paying the bills, he made dental tools. And when gunpowder was scarce during the Revolutionary War, he built a gunpowder mill. After the war ended, Revere expanded his business into bell forging, eventually making the bell that hangs in King's Chapel a Boston landmark. William Kidd, born 1645. Captain William Kidd was a Scottish privateer turned pirate and the center of numerous pirate legends. Not much is known about Kidd before the late 17th century, given his year of birth is approximate. It's reasonably certain he is from Scotland, but that's about it. Every good pirate needs a mysterious past. Kidd first appears in historical records in 1689, when he's listed as captain. He was a privateer for Britain in the West Indies, before sailing for New York City, where he lived for several years. In 1695, Kidd was given a privateer's commission to hunt ships in the Indian Ocean, and headed for Madagascar, which at the time was a known pirate haven. Then Kidd disobeyed the terms of his privateer's commission, attacking ships in the Red Sea. No one is quite sure why, but I guess that's pirates for you. They're bonkers. When Kidd returned to the West Indies in 1699, he found that he was a hunted man, he sold his ship, the, Qu the Queda Merchant, in Hispaniola, and headed up the coast in a new ship. Kidd knew he was likely to be caught and wanted to have bargaining chips to secure his own freedom, so he started hiding treasure as he went, the idea being that he could later give away the locations in order to save his own skin. Kidd was finally captured when he returned home to New York. He tried to talk and buy his way out of arrest, but it didn't work. He was hanged for piracy in 1701, which must have been so annoying. As for Kidd's treasure, it's known that he buried some of it on Gardner's Island off the coast of Long Island, New York. That part was eventually recovered after Kidd's death. Nobody knows what else he hid, but speculation still rages today over how much he buried and where. The Tories thing, no matter what we do, might as well make it count. Let's talk. Ah, Connor. Hello again. What brings you to Boston? You. Would you excuse us, fellows? 
Thank you. That conversation was about to turn unpleasant. Now, what can I do for you? I was hoping you could help me locate William Johnson. Of course. I'm headed to a meeting with some men who should be able to help. Why don't you come along? Ah, it's good to see the people finally taking a stand against injustice. Says the man who owns a slave. <laughs> Ooh, sorry? Sorry. Servant in household of Samuel Adams, 1765 onward, she was given to the Adams' second wife, Elizabeth Wells, as a wedding present, because nothing says you care like, here, have a human being. Adams was morally opposed to slavery, insisted she was freed. She was, and worked for the Adams family for 50 years, uh, which would be so much less fun than working for the Adams family. Uh huh. Incidentally, while Adams wouldn't own slaves himself, it wasn't something he fought particularly hard for during his political career. He supported anti-slavery measures in Massachusetts, never forced the issue, uh, getting on politicians, and obviously talking about Samuel Adams here, not Gomez. I practice what I preach, my friend. She's not a slave, but a freed woman, at least on paper. Men's minds are not so easily turned. It's a tragedy that for all our progress, still we cling to such barbarism. Then speak out against it. Hmm. We must focus first on defending our rights. When this is done, we'll have the luxury of addressing these other matters. You speak as though your condition is equal to that of the slaves. It is not. Tell that to my neighbor who is compelled to quarter British troops, or to my friend whose store was closed because he displeased the crown. The people here are no freer than Surrey. You offer excuses instead of solutions. All people should be equal, and not in turns. It's in <laughs> turns, or not at all. We must compromise, Connor, however painful that may be. Try and solve all the world's problems at the same time, and you'll... It works. Hey! It's my home, no matter what you thieves call taxmen say! If the gums in Parliament who want to take my property, you tell them to sail across the pond and take it themselves! It's not open for discussion now. Open this door or these men will break it down! Ah! Ah, bollocks! We're coming in! Ah! Oh. I trust the mounting evidence is proof enough, Connor. Continue on. I shall meet you at our destination. What are you gonna do? Ah, I could use some support! <laughs> Come on, you lobster! Is that all you have? Ah, I could use some support. You're welcome. Justice for once. I dare the governor to send more. You all right? I'm fine. It's not my first dance. For all their teeth and claws, these little foxes, they fight like puppies. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. I'd buy you a nail, but uh, I'm expecting somewhere else. Okay. Uh... Minimap. What is all of that? Liberation mission. Uh, some other time? I have some constraints on this mission. Fine, I'll do this one.
Okay. Good citizens. Upon your con You haven't seen anything. Wait. Tax collectors. So much How much money are you carrying? A pound is hardly burdensome, but it has been imposed uh, without our account, rendering us mere spectators of our own commerce. Gentlemen dilettantes, amateurs, and the curious public, yeah. Toby Law will demonstrate tomorrow by the bell. Oh. You probably hold this something good, right? Meh. Connor, I'd like you to meet some like minded friends. The owner of this fine establishment, William Molyneux, and the manager and chef of his newest venture, Stefan Chaffaut. Oh, hi. Ah! Connor and I just had a ball uh, with some red coats and forcing some tax men outside my home. The collectors grow bolder and more forceful. Something we must address, Samuel. Then let us raise a banner. Something to let the people know that they are not alone. The docks are an angry place of late. Protesters picketing the latest shipments of British tea. The eyes of the city are upon that stage. A Bostonian without his tea is a dangerous beast. <laughs> William Johnson is smuggling the tea off the ships. One of his men tried to sell me this. A sample of what I refused. But it's from those ships. No mistaking the stamp. He's charging a king's ransom. Must be he's making a mint off those who buy it. Where is he now? I've never met the man. May I ask why you seek him, Connor? He intends to purchase the land upon which my village stands. Without the consent of my people. No doubt the revenue from his little smuggling endeavor is financing the acquisition. A tax enforced on tea grants a boon to smugglers. I'll wager the same men who levy the taxes are selling the tea. A stage requires a spectacle, and I may know the play. Okay. Boy, the smuggles Connor, kind of stuff. head back to the docks. And see to the destruction of the tea. If you should need us, return here. Go on, Connor. I'm going, I'm going. It's just this guy with a game that I'm not gonna play. And this guy has a game that I'm also not gonna play. Hello, Connor. That tea is being illegally smuggled all around Boston by Johnson's men. If you see any crates in transit, perhaps you could put a stop to the delivery. And those moody tax collectors are still at it. Oh, merde. <clears throat> Pardon me. Oh, come on, mate. <laughs> the Tea Act passed 1773, attempt by the British government to prop up the British East India Company by allowing it to ship tea to the colonies directly from India, without having it go through Britain first. This made the tea much less expensive, even cheaper than the tea the colonists were smuggling from the Dutch to avoid paying British taxes. The problem was that, even with the cheaper prices, the British government was still collecting tax on the tea. 
meaning bind T would run a counter to the colonial no taxation without representation stance. The move was seen as, and probably was, Parliament's sneaky attempt to get the colonies to unconsciously agree to one tax, in the hope of imp implementing others. The colonists didn't fall for it, and attempts to force the unloading of East India Tea in Boston caused the Boston Tea Party, perhaps the worst tea party of all time. It wasn't even catered, you people are savages. What do you mean it wasn't catered? There was a lot of tea. The Stamp Act passed 1765. British government's attempt to recoup some of the money they spent during the French and Indian War by taxing the American colonists, who theoretically benefited most from it. Parliament chose stamp tax because it was simple, easily implemented, and the colonists couldn't smuggle their way out of paying it. All papers, from newspapers to legal documents to lawyers' licenses, would need to purchase a government stamp to be used. Colonists, however, didn't think Britain had the right to tax them at all, since there were no colonial representatives in Parliament, hence a snappy revolutionary slogan. They also resented the suggestion that they were responsible for Britain's war debts, since the colonial militia had a huge role in fighting and winning the French-Indian War. Huge public protests were organized run by groups who called themselves the Sons of Liberty. Merchants declared a boycott of British goods, perhaps most importantly the people assigned to collect the tax were threatened and intimidated into resigning. The Massachusetts stamp distributor was even paraded through Boston by the Sons of Liberty and forced to resign at the Liberty Tree. No stamp taxes were ever collected and British repealed the Stamp Act in 1766, but it wasn't an entire victory for the colonies. Parliament then passed something called the Declaratory Act, essentially stating that Britain had absolute right to tax the colonists and there wasn't anything the colonists could do about it. Nothing that is, except start their own country. I'm all, I always fancy doing that. Yeah. Okay. Limit firearm use. Sure. No firearm use. That's it. No firearm use. Head back to the docks. Which docks? Those docks. Set the smugglers and destroy the merchandise. <laughs> Is there anything else in the way? Powder Kex is soy smuggled cargo. I can do that. But limit firearm use. And I'm guessing a bow won't do it. That is considered firearms? What the hell? The reload last checkpoint. You guys are ridiculous. Okay. Other idea. Yep. 
Here's an idea. Climb the ship. Right, it was out of range. It is the right target. Come on! You shouldn't be standing there. Do not stand there. Then what? How? You said powder kegs, right? Oh, you mean these powder kegs? These are not powder kegs. Well, what? How? When? This makes no sense. Okay. Keep it simple. Stupid. And he drowned. Okay. Now. This is tea. Ah, plant. Plant what? Run away! You can stay here. I'll figure the rest of it out. Can these things roll? I can pick it up! Okay. On the top. We'll handle that one first. What are you doing? Get out of there. I'm just gonna put that here. No one has to worry about anything. And give me that. And I'm out of here. Bo? Okay. Come and get me. Come on. Get out of there. 
Wait, that didn't do anything. What did I miss? No, okay. Get on the horse. Get over there. Over to the other dock. Where is this thing? Uh, not at all marked. Okay. That's a powder carrier. I put it on the wrong stack. Got it. This is where you put it. Come here. Nope. No one important died, right? Pick up. That stack is gone. But the guards remain. Oh, there are powder kegs. Come here. Let's do this. Do you have shot? Liberate the district from Templar influence. Um, let's start here. McNeil's rope yard. These buildings were used to make rope for ship rigging. Please try and stay awake. Ships that design need a surprising amount of rope, up to 20 miles of the stuff each, which you'll realize is incredible if you're a rope nerd. <laughs> this will wake you up. Rope isn't the real reason this place is well known, among historians, I mean. In March of 1770, one of the workers here asked a passing British soldier if he wanted a job and told him to go clean my shithouse. The soldier was so offended that he started a fight. Then he left. 
came back with several of his friends and started a full-on brawl. That one insult led to days of fighting between soldiers and rope workers, leading right up to the Boston Massacre. The relationship between the British and the Bostonians at the time was a little tense, to say the least. History does not reveal if that worker ever had his shithouse cleaned, but it seems unlikely. <coughs> mill Pond. This is the site of Boston's first and for good a while only flour mill. The mill owners closed this pond off from the Charles River, leaving only a small stream that led to the ocean. Twice a day, the tides in Boston Harbor would fill the stream, powering the mill. Of course, closing the pond off also made it stagnant. This water was used as a dumping ground for sewage, garbage, and dead animals. It was quite dirty and frankly stank. Around the turn of the century, the city decided that something needed to be done. Rather than reopen the causeway and clean out the pond, developers decided they could make room for houses and also more money by filling it in with land taken from the top of Beacon Hill. So that's exactly what they did. Building homes on sewage since the turn of the century. What a wonderful slogan that would have made. Where am I going? Over there. Next. No? No next? New stuff in stores. Almanac page. New firearm. Duckfoot pistol. What is a duckfoot pistol? Again, invisible almanac. Oh, it isn't. Um. I freed them for it right here. Uh, let's go to the shop. I think. Central district is disputed. So, Duckfoot. And here would like to sell stuff, but I don't have anything to sell. Nothing new here. Nothing new here. Yeah, these are junk. Firearms. Duckfoot. Rate of fire six. Rate of fire three. Uh huh. Why would I want to buy it? Multi pistols can fire three bullets at once, named after its duck foot shape. It's intended to scatter threatening groups at close range. As such, it became a popular choice for jailkeepers and naval officers looking to discourage mutiny. Ugh. I don't, I don't like it. Mm. 
buying outfits last. Lexington feathers, 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 page map. Yes. Buying maps instead of outfitting the ship. Trinket map. It's okay, there's plenty of money. Poison dots. Oh, the non lethal. Citizens, that is a great deal of money. Money, the House of Commons. Kind of want to just kill those two. Thank you. That's it. Keep going. Old Corner Bookstore. It's an apothecary shop at the moment. I think I've read that one. Yeah. Old North Meeting House. I think I went that, read that one too. And the Old South Meeting House. Boston Common. This has the honor of being the first public park in North America. It started off as a pasture of William Blackstone. Or Blackston, if you, prefer the <coughs> if you prefer the original spelling, who, despite his name, was the first white settler in this area. When Boston started growing, Blackstone decided to move somewhere more remote. He sold the land to the growing city for 30 pounds, and they turned it into common land, hence the name. For the first century or two of Boston's history, this was a place to pasture your cows, no more than 70 at a time. Real soldiers, the British regulars camped here, but then the occasional public's hanging for offenses such as being a witch or being a Quaker, or perhaps simply take a nice walk near all the camps and the hanging. The British left the camp when, the f when they fled the city in 1776. Public hangings ended in 18 1817. The cows were banned in 1830. You can still take a walk, however, but what's the point without the cows? Got a point. Beacon Hill. Thus, predictably, Beacon Hill gets its name because the Puritan settlers placed a beacon on the hilltop. Beacon here essentially meant a bucket full of pitch hanging from a pole. The idea being it could be lit to warm the, to warm the countryside of the, if the town was attacked. Simple, effective, and never actually used. The hill is shorter today than it used to be. The top of it was carted off to fill in Mill Pond. This had the advantage of making the hilltop easier to build on and creating more land at Mill Pond, a two-for-one deal for developers. Beacon Hill became the place to live in Boston after the new Massachusetts State House opened here in 1790. Developers created upscale housing on the south side of the hill, which overlooks the Boston Common. The north side of the hill had been settled earlier and was much less posh, sometimes going by the evocative nickname of Mount Horden. What a magical address. George Washington, ever the politician, would refer to it, one, to it in one of his letters as Mount Horum, though that sounds more like an instruction than a place. <laughs> okay. Cook with a firearm? Stefan, what is wrong? Where is Sam Adams? Who cares? I've been robbed! Where are you going? To get back what's rightfully mine. Limit time, what? Limit time spent in open conflict, limit Chapeau's health loss, perform low profile assassinations. One minute.
Okay. Limit spent time not cutters. Low profile assassination. Got it. Oh! Regardez! Some pathetic redcoats waiting for a beating! I will match your face for your jacket, Capule! Coquins me prennent mon père au Canada et voilà qu'ils me ravissent ma propriété ici. Il suffit. Ok. Where are we going now? Let me past you stupid ingrates. We are not English. We are not the king's men. We are free. But the king sends these red coats to shoot us around. They are not our masters. This is our city. Let's show them who owns it. It's time to fight. Stefan, please. Stop and listen to me! I've listened for long enough. They come into my home and take my things? I will get my revenge. The man responsible for this will pay. His friends will pay. Voilà trop longtemps que je subis ces affronts. Ils vont goûter de mon courroux. Yeah, that's coming by fast. You looking for a fight, Englishman? I'll give you what you want. Oh boy. Hey, Red Coats! Your king is a big! Où que j'aille, l'on doit croire mon chemin. Ils me volent ma maison, ils m'obligent à fuir mon pays, et les voici qui veulent s'approprier ma nouvelle demeure. Hey, I'm not worth anything. Can I control my camera, please? Thank you. Them too? There is a way to fight injustice, but this is not it. <sighs> what are we doing? You're kind of being ridiculous. I will match your face to your jacket, Capule! Destroyed? You stupid mackerel! I suppose you want me to tell Johnson his tea mm. just spontaneously combusted? Nonsense! Someone's responsible for this, and you will find out who! And if you can't, I'll gut you! and find a smarter mongrel who can. What do we do? Create a window. Use your assassin recruits in combat to activate the unique abilities. Hold page up to open the recruit wheel. Assassinate. Okay. That's it. That's what we can do. Lock into a target and press page up to send your allies to assassinate. Bloody hell are you? Damn. Why? 
You have no right to rob people blind. By decree of the British Parliament or not. British Parliament? I work for William Johnson. Johnson? And his suffering cleanly. Please. Yeah, it's not a great weapon for this. The people seem to have an ear for you. What are the things you lost? The people listen to me only because I spoke the truth loud enough. Which is worth 1,000 times the content of my footlocker. The English, they can keep my things. You did well tonight. I said I'd buy you an ale when you first helped me. In place of drink, I offer you my allegiance. For what it's worth. It's Your worth. aid is welcome, and I am grateful. Now, I need to find Sam Adams. Yeah, where do we go? New weapon available, Hessian X. Right. Mm -hmm. Good permissions with the weapon to free. You now have new recruit. Oh, we're doing this again. Quebec. Rewards, XP, money, and stuff. Sure. Okay. William Johnson. Stefan Chapeau is a Boston militiaman and served as a cook in the years leading up to the revolution. Chapeau was born in what's now Canada near modern day Montreal. His father was a cook for the French army and was killed in the fighting of the plains of Abraham. After his death, Chapeau took on work as a chef in Montreal but moved to Boston in 1764. While his personal letters indicate he was looking for a less complicated life, he was just in time for the unrest that preceded the revolution. Fortunately for Chapeau, he didn't actually want a quiet life, and as it happened, the tensions in pre-revolution Boston suited him exactly. Which is weird, because who enjoys tensions, apart from, this, from a scientist studying surface tension as an effect of intermolecular attraction? Give me a minute to stop laughing. Chapeau was a man in search of a cause, and he found it in the Patriots. He was an enthusiastic supporter of the Sons of Liberty, participating in the 1765 protests surrounding the Stamp Act. He was present when the crowds ransacked Governor Hutchinson House in 1765, probably egging on the mob. He was also one of the crowd that witnessed and partially caused the Boston Massacre. Chapeau didn't limit himself to protests. I have several fines for him on the books in the 1760s and 70s of public drunkenness and brawling. It seems he couldn't keep out of a fight when the opportunity arose, and in pre-revolution Boston, there was always an opportunity. It was a wonderful time to be an angry drunk, and the world was your oyster. Lenape, also called the Lenny Lenape, or the Delaware. Before European colonization, the Lenape lived mostly along the banks of the Delaware River in what's modern day New Jersey and Pennsylvania. The Lenape were one of the first nations to come into contact with Europeans, most significantly with William Penn, who founded Pennsylvania, which was a stroke of luck, given his name. While the Lenape relationship with Penn was mostly peaceful, when Penn died, his sons forced most of the Lenape off their land in a deal known as the Walking Purchase. During the French and Indian War, the Lenape sided primarily with the French, though some individual groups would later leave to join the British. In 1778, they were the first to sign a land treaty with the Continental Congress, agreeing to provide scouts to the army in exchange for supplies. I imagine they simply liked to find cheeses and onions. The newly formed United States showed its gratitude by eventually moving the Lenape into isolated communities in Ohio and southern Canada. How wonderfully thoughtful. If 
your joints excruciate, ears sanguinate, or feet distend and tumefy, you have but one new and miraculous ointment. What do you need, my friend? What do you have? What has to? Hessian X. Very slow. A lot more damage. Cost of freaking fortune. Let's give it a go. How uh, do I access any of this? Ah, oh, okay. Catnip. Oh, snake root, oak bark. Hunting beaver pelt. Barrels. Beeswax. And I sell this? Why did you make it complicated? <laughs> Royal pistol. Twin holsters. I want that. Hanger sword. Cutter sword. Uh, rosewood lumber and wolf belt. Rosewood lumber and wolf belt. This is just annoying me. Columns barriers of Needle Street, the place to go. So, yes, you're cute. Fellow citizens, soon the tea is to be unloaded, and the so it's here. Let's try to use it instead of a tomahawk. Uh, in progress, okay. That's a patrol. Where are they going? Okay, it never worked well. Come on, block something.
Stefan was injured. Uh huh, recuperating. Oh well. That was gruesome. Do you have anything interesting? The Boston Gazette humbly proposes. Uh, excuse me, there's something in your back. There's something in your stomach. But Governor Hutchison refuses to let them leave. Wants us to take the tea, pay the duties, and say thank you kindly to the king. The king can kindly kiss my arse. You. What's up? What happens now? We wait for the signal. What signal? This meeting can do nothing further to save the country. Mm -hmm. That one. And then what? Evening, gentlemen. Shall we be off? No. What's the matter? I have spent today drawn from one bit of madness to another with nothing to show for it. Before I go any further, I would like to know exactly what it is you intend. Of course. First, we make our way to Nathaniel Bradley's house to fetch the rest of our little group. Then it's on to Griffin's Wharf, where we board the ships and dump the tea. Simple as that. Simple seems a bit charitable. Cheer up, Connor. For tonight, we are all victors. The Sons of Liberty get to send a message to England, and you rob William Johnson of his financing. Your village will be saved. I have an idea. Why don't you lead the way? That should keep us out of any further trouble. Am I right? Hmm. Boston, December 16, 1773. Damn it. More guards. We need to turn the crowd's anger to our advantage. Say the world, Connor, and I will make it so. Let's switch over to. Okay. Eliminate the guards. Sons of Liberty. The Sons of Liberty was the name given to a number of protest groups that formed to protest the Stamp Act and stayed together afterwards organizing anti-British rallies and enforcing boycotts in the lead up to the revolution. It was like a friendly club for angry men. Although the groups would later become more coordinated, they started separately. Sons of Liberty was the usual choice for a name because it was a popular phrase meaning colonist at the time. As you might predict, given the name, Sons were mostly middle class and, yes, male, merchant lawyers and politicians. Paul Revere was likely a member of the Boston group to give an example. The sons in all of the colonies weren't above using violence and intimidation to get their way. Who was? They threatened all of the stamp distributors into resigning, with the Boston group doing so far as to destroy the local distributor's offices and parade him through town before he quit in a very public and likely terrified resignation speech. Given that, it probably won't surprise you to learn they earned a reputation for being in the radical wing of the Patriots, rallying the people and sometimes losing control of them. Public protests in Boston turned into an angry mob that burned the governor's mansion. Some groups of the Suns were also known to tar and feather British offic officials and sometimes loyalists. You know, standard good guy stuff. What a really terrific way to blow off steam. I have an idea. Come on. Up to it.
Thank you. Kind of heavy. Not sure I like it. Can I lose it? Can you drop this thing? <laughs> 